And that brings us to today's stone, which is covenant. So what is covenant? It's simply just an intentional relationship. God intentionally pursues purposeful relationships. A lot of times in our life, we know people, we're like, oh, that's all my friends. And then the reality of it is, they're not really your friends. They're a work associate, the guy in the gym, the one you fist bump at Walmart, you know. We're talking about covenant relationships. God has intentionally entered into covenant relationships with us. And if we're mirroring God, then we should also enter into covenant relationships. We talk about marriage being a covenant relationship, but there's so many others. So I want to go over a couple, uh, a couple things related to covenant. And one of the first things that I found that I really love, and it's from Psalms 2514. And it reads, The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him. And he makes known to them his covenant. So a couple things. I was talking to a friend of mine from, from Brazil, and he's like, so in America, when y'all say fear, like, do y'all, y'all think reverence? I'm like, no, we think we're scared to death. So just so we're clear, fear is reverence, right? Reverencing the Lord, holy, honorable, respect. So the first thing is friendship. I love the word friendship when it's talking about covenant. Because, you know, friendship, we may look at ourselves in friendship. And look, there's been times in my life where I've had some sweet friends. But I wasn't a sweet person to that friend. So it wasn't a friendship. It was a sweet person pouring into my life, and I wasn't reciprocating because I wasn't being a good friend. That's not a covenant. That's not a covenant. It's a one-way relationship. So when God says, if you fear me, if you reverence me, if you hold me holy, then we're friends. Like I say on the bayous of South Louisiana, then we padnas. We padnas, we're friends. If you become a friend of the Lord, then he will make his covenant known to you. So if you're wondering, like, well, what's my life about? Like, what does God want from me? What, what is it all about, those big existential questions? If you want to know what God's purpose in entering into a relationship with you is about, become a friend to God. Reverence him. Hold him holy. Honor him by reading his word, seeking his face, knowing his image, understand his authority as judge, respecting the fact that he's creator. Become a reciprocating friend. You know, when God healed me of that, and I realized, like, I got no friends. When I, was, when I left Louisiana as a chief of police, I had hundreds of people who catered to me. Catered to me. When God called me to retire, I had nobody. And I'm like, Leah, what happened? All this brothers in the blue. and da-da. She goes, those weren't your friends. They were your uh, employees, you know, your associates, your acquaintances. But I no longer had earthly authority to do anything for those people. And they no longer had value for me. And so we come to Dallas. I go from, from every restaurant had a table for me. And I come to Dallas and I can't get a booth at Chick-fil-A. And, and we love Chick-fil-A. And, and so, you, so when you realize that you've rooted your identity in what you do and not whose you are, then we're in a corrupted state. And we cannot come into covenant relationships with other believers. And, and remember, and look, make no mistake, covenant relationships are reserved for believers. If you're, not, if you're, if you're trying to enter into a covenant relationship with a non-believer, that's a contractual obligation. It's totally different. You're not speaking the same language. So some of the failed efforts that we make in culture to enter into covenant is, is the first one. It's, it's the little pinky promise. I was thinking, I'm like, what do we do to make these signs of covenant? Because, um, you know, the, the root word for covenant, part of it is cut, a cutting. You know, um, Adam was cut to take the rib, and Abram, the, the covenant with him was the circumcision, cutting of the foreskin when, when Christ was crucified, uh, the, the piercing. So that's a big part of covenant, entering into a, a formal covenant. But in culture, we're like, well, we're just going to do a little pinky promise. And we think it's cute. And it's cute for kids. But you know, the history of a, a pinky promise was if you broke the promise, the one you aggrieved had the right to break your pinky. I don't know if anybody's ever broken a finger or a pinky, but it's painful. And there's ministries called Pinky Promise. And I'm like, that's not cool. <laughs> because, I mean, we're basing a covenant relationship on the cultural practice 
of a pinky promise. You know, another way of, of entering to covenant relationships. When I was a kid, I thought, yeah. And I'd watch these old movies, you know, and the two adversaries would come, come to terms. And what, the one of them would, like, pull out a big old rusty knife, and he'd go, oh! Blood ripping down his thing. And then he'd hand that rusty blade to, the, to his former adversary, and he'd go, oh! And then they'd rip hands! And then, like, hepatitis, and everything is circulating. <laughs> and then they take somebody's do-rag, and they tie their hand. And they're like, we're blood brothers. And like, I'm like, yeah, yeah. When you don't know Jesus, you're like, yeah. And then I think, like, then they go to commercial. It's like, how long are they standing there? Like, how long you got to stand there for this blood brother transfusion? But, you know, like it appealed to him. People still do it today. But you know, they were almost right in the cutting. But where they missed it was that it's only the blood of Jesus that can make you brothers. So right intention, wrong outcome. That's not a covenant relationship. It's, it's a desperate effort to come up with something to bond people. Uh, then, you know, the other way is swears and promises right? We espouse these lofty ideals. You know, I will love you to the end of time. You are so blah, blah, blah. And we expect that there be substance to that. But let me tell you what happens when we rely on our, on our, on our heads and our hearts. When we're doing our head and heart, it's an inward reliance. It's an inner oath that we can't keep. Instead of giving it to God, and allowing him to seal a covenant relationship with another believer. And so if you're thinking, well, I'm pretty smart. My head can, I can, I can keep my promise. Well, let me tell you what God says about your head and my head. Because mine's, like Leah says, it's big and it's hard. And, um, <laughs> but it says, but I tell you, do not swear an oath at all. Either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it's his footstool. Or by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair black or white. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. So, now you're wanting to enter into a covenant. Not a contractual obligation. That's business. This is spiritual. So save the, the, the fanciful words, the alibis and the excuses. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. If you want to enter into a true covenant relationship, it's based on the blood of Jesus Christ. So you're like, but my heart, my heart, right? I'll love you forever. And like one of my pet peeves is I see people and they're like, I love you more than you'll ever know. I'm like, that really stinks. Like, how could you do that to me or your kids, right? I mean, like God's got no problem explaining how much he loves us. How much does God love us? He gave us his only son, right? That's pretty definitive. So, but when you see people that, I love you more than you'll ever know. Seriously? Like, that's the best you got? <laughs> so let me tell you about the heart. The heart is deceitful above all things. And it's extremely sick. Who can understand it fully and know its secret motives? I, the Lord, search and examine the mind. I test the heart to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. Now, we can either rely on, on a God covenant, or we can rely on our own head and our own heart. You see the, the, the temporal nature, the temporary nature, when we depend on, on inner, inward, as opposed to giving it to God in, in a covenant relationship. You know, I want to ask you, just a moment of self-reflection, is like, think about your relationships. And, and think about what, what relationships are you in that are truly covenant relationships. And as you reflect, I'll just remind, a covenant relationship is a very purposeful, intentional, tangible relationship with an identified outcome. Why did God begin covenant relationships with man? Right? He entered into a covenant relationship with Adam for a marriage, Eve, and then they failed. And from that point, there's five historical, biblical covenants that God entered into with man. And what was the tangible result? It was for the redemption, for the corruption in the beginning. 
So think about what relationships are you engaged in that are purposeful, intentional, identifiable, with, with a very specific outcome. I mean, the first should be marriage, right? And, and just to say, like, well, our marriage, our, our goal was the same as your marriage goal. They're all different. We came into marriage as a blended family. So our marriage was, was not to kill each other and the kids. And we've done pretty good, except for the plants that you kill every season. But other than that, we're doing good, right? So we, we, even where marriage is, it's not a one-size-fits-all, but it's a covenant relationship. So really think about the relationships you're in and start to identify them almost in a way of concentric circles where your covenant relationships are, are God-ordained, God-blessed. And then start to identify uh, what relationships are friendships and acquaintances and, and just casual, you know, likes on Facebook. And don't mistake the, 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 the different relationships. Because if you're, if you're dealing with, a, with an acquaintance and you're expecting it to, to bear spiritual fruit, you're going to be hurt. You're going to be hurt and you're going to be disappointed. So the goal is, is to focus on creating these, these very tangible covenant relationships with other believers. And like I said, your first should be with God, always number one. And then if you're married with your spouse, your kids, other believers. And it's not just enough to be like, yeah, we cool. We text every once in a while. Like, that's nothing. That's nothing. The world can do that. God's called us into covenant relationship. And how do we learn to do it? We learn to do it by being in covenant relationship with him. And then from that lesson, we learn to enter into covenant relationship with other people. You want to see the value of your relationships? We talk about who's, who's your five. Remember, we talk about that. It's a sociological construct that says you'll become the aggregate of the five people you're closest to. You want to be a knucklehead? Hang around five knuckleheads. You want to be successful? Hang around five successful people. You know, we say you want to be a good Christian? Hang around with God because that's God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's three out of your five people right there. Now just find two decent Christians and you're doing okay. But in those relationships require a covenant relationship with one another. You know, we talk about, um, I, I like to talk about the term spiritual rebar. Like when, when um, Corona, COVID hit, and everybody got separated, and you started to see the, the fabric of even the Christian community start to be pulled apart. And God put the word about, about a vision about spiritual rebar. And you know, rebar is not pretty. It's, it's, you never see it, right? It's the first thing that goes in on the ground before they lay the foundation, and you see the steel and the glass and the beautiful stone structures. But covenant relationships are the rebar. It lays the foundation upon which relationships are built. So when we're thinking about covenant relationship, and it really clarified my mind where that's concerned, is how do we pursue and what is a covenant relationship? It is about building spiritual rebar. It's fun if we can all just, hey, have a birthday every Sunday celebration. But the truth is, before we can come to this, we've got to come to this. Where we're texting, where we're praying, where we're crying, where we're mad, where we're asking forgiveness, where we're giving affirmation. That's the stitching, the welding, the mending, the creating of spiritual rebar. I mean, that rebar, doesn't have, it can't say, I want to be a glass high-rise structure. Well, your part of the body is to be under the dirt, laying the foundation. If to build these covenant relationships require, sometimes getting in the dirt, getting your hands dirty, not even the, the world seeing to give you a Facebook like. It's what you do interpersonally that creates these covenant relationships. You know, the difference between that and a, and a contractual obligation, and we teach this a lot in marriage, and if there's anybody that's wanting to, to start joining our Wednesday marriage classes, it's not too late. We'll make room. But a contractual obligation is it's always 50-50. You know, we'll ask, we'll ask couples that, we, that we're doing mentoring to, marriage mentoring, counseling, and we're like, okay, right? You, you gotta, you, y'all are married, and you got 100 bucks in the bank. How much do you have? I got 50 bucks. Wrong. You both got 100, Right? But in a contractual obligation, it's 50-50. In a contractual obligation, it's, there's an out clause. In a contractual obligation, there, there's, there's reward for good and there's punishment for bad, right? And in a contractual obligation, it's always going into it with a one-upsmanship. Like, I'm going to benefit from you without me having to bleed too much for you. 
So I asked you to, to look at your relationships close. Are they covenant? Now maybe take a second and think about the people you're engaged closest with. Are they more contractual than covenant? Are you, are you in fellowship with someone for, for what they can do for you? Right? Maybe business benefit or maybe, maybe uh, just something. Are you, are you giving as much as you're getting? Like we teach in the marriage classes, you're only as successful as your, as your willingness and ability to outgive your spouse. You should always be trying to outgive one another. And it's the same thing in relationships, in covenant relationships. If one's just always taking, taking, using. Look, at what I used to be, a, 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 people were commodities to me. If you were a good shooter, you became my sniper. If you were a good interrogator, you became my head detective. I mean, people were commodities. And there were no relationships. So when God called me to retire and leave the only job I'd ever known, that's why nobody followed me. Because all my commodities stayed on the shelf. And God freed me from that. And I started praying for covenant relationships. And God started bringing men into my life and taught me how to be a good friend, taught me how to pursue relationships, taught me not to be so surface. Because I wasn't a good friend to have. And I would ask some of y'all, are you a good friend to have? I would say most of you are, because we're friends. And I love you like crazy. But in your other relationships, in your marriage, is it a contractual obligation? Or have you entered into a true covenant relationship? I want to go over real brief. There's five major covenants that God entered into with humanity. Again, with a very specific intention of redemption of humanity. And I want to relate them to today. The first uh, is the marriage covenant. That was Adam and Eve. That's still active today. I don't care what people say. Living together ain't the thing, okay? I mean, you know, oh, I don't know we got to get married. It's just a piece of paper. Listen, you know, what Caesar's give to Caesar, but you got to come into a marriage covenant relationship. If it involves a wedding, you, you do the wedding, right? Because he, God says, what Caesar's give to Caesar. But the marriage covenant still holds true. The first one, after the fall, is the grace covenant. And that was given to Noah. God had had enough, and he's going to wipe it out, everything, but he had grace for Noah. People, oh man, Noah, Noah was righteous and Noah got favor. Noah was favored because God gave grace. We experience God's grace in that same covenant that he gave Noah. Noah. The second is the multiplication covenant. And that's what he gave to Abram when he said, I'm going to make you a great nation. And Abram, who came Abraham, and his wife uh, Sarah, I was like, I'm just an old dude. Like, how are you going to make me a great nation? Just have faith. Multiplication. And that multiplication covenant still exists today. When God said, be fruitful and multiply in the beginning, he didn't change his mind today. You know, and, and I, we talk, I was talking to a young guy today about kingdom entrepreneurship. The principle of multiplication goes for everything we do. If you're a kingdom entrepreneur, God wants to bless your business. God wants to bless your provision. Like, I don't, I don't know where, like, 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 poverty became biblical chic. Like, well, you know, we're being successful financially. Um, that makes me a bad Christian. No, it doesn't make you a bad Christian. God wants to bless you mightily. Go to Matthew and the, the parable of the five talents. God gave five, two, and one. Five took the risk, made the investment, was a good steward. Two did the same thing. One was scared and buried it. So when God, came, when, when the master came back, what did he do? He doubled, he doubled. He took the one and gave it to the guy with, with 10. Now he's got 11. That's the principle of multiplication. And some people, oh, that's prosperity gospel. That's prosperity. Then good. God wants you to be prosperous. Prosperous. And in that prosperity, he wants you to be a good steward. In your marriage, be prosperous. And then be a good steward. Mentor other couples. Mentor your kids. In your business, God wants to make you prosperous. Use that prosperity and be a good steward. So the multiplication covenant that God made with Abram to be a mighty nation still applies today. All these covenants are still in effect 
until we come to full redemption. Because that was the intended purpose of the covenant. That's why God had to do what he had to do. The other is the deliverance covenant, which is what he made with Moses. He said, I'm going to deliver my people out of captivity. Look, a lot of us are still living in bondage. A lot of us are still living in the pain and the shame and the guilt that's been strapped to us. I always tell men, I minister to a lot of men, I'm like, like you're still carrying the shame of what happened to you as a child. I used to do it. I was violently abused as a child. And as a man, I hated myself for letting that happen to me. This happened for a long time. And then God delivered me. And he said, Scott, don't judge little Scott by big Scott's standards. You see, what happened to little Scott drove big Scott to be the way he was. So if you're carrying shame and pain and guilt over what happened to you as a child or a younger person, and you're judging yourself by that today, understand there's grace. Understand there's mercy. Understand there's deliverance. Understand that God does not want you. God the judge does not want you judging little you by today's you standard. Today's you needs to have mercy and grace and understand that God sent his son to free you from that. The same covenant that he made with Moses, the deliverance covenant he made for you. If you're struggling in your marriage, if you're struggling with addiction, whatever you're struggling with, God delivered us in the example of Moses. The next covenant is the kingship covenant. That's what he made with David. That's what he made with David. Even when nobody else believed in David. Even when Jesse was like, mm, nah, these are all my boys. I saw on Facebook you had one other little guy. David, maybe? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Come on. Look, if you feel like David, if you feel like you've been left out, if you feel like you've been abandoned or overlooked, or you don't look like, or you don't look like a king, or you don't look like uh, one that God would actually anoint and appoint. Look, that's why God made the, made, the, made the covenant with David. He anointed, he appointed this boy. Okay? God made the same covenant with you. Revelations tells us we were, we were made to be kings and priests. That's God's word. That's not some motivational speaker wanting you to feel better about yourself, wanting to put some money in a bucket. That's God's word. You're made to be kings and priests, but you got to act like it. you got to be like David. you got to be willing to put the work in. When nobody's watching that kid that his dad didn't even care about, he's killing lions and bears. He's doing the work. So when the time came, that defining moment is, is arrived, that you're willing to step up and pick up the mantle of being a king and a priest. God made that covenant for us. And the last covenant, the most important covenant, is the redemption covenant. God made that for us. God gave us a path to redemption. So when you feel like you're in captivity, or slavery, or chained to abuse, or chained to your future, or chained to, to, to anything other than the positive, affirming word of life, that's God. God delivers us through redemption. And the most beautiful promise of that of that of that covenant and we know it but I want to remind you of it and it goes back to what I said before when people well I love you more than you'll ever know let's be very clear let's be very clear how much God loves you for God so loved the world and you could substitute your name right there for God so loved Mark for God so loved Sylvia for God so loved Natasha for God so loved Ken for God so loved Leah, for God so loved Kim, for God so loved Elizabeth. Substitute your name. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn Adam, to condemn April, to condemn Mandy to condemn Adam, to condemn Scott, but to save the world through him. 
That's the covenant of redemption. That's how much God loves you. Because he's entered into a purposeful, intentional relationship. If we're going to mirror God, we're going to know God, we're going to reflect God, then we too have got to begin focusing on those covenant relationships with one another. Let's be intentional. Let's be purposeful. Let's have identified goals. The goals to do life together. The goals maybe to be discipled by one another. Maybe you're looking for your, Paul, uh, your Timothy. Maybe you're looking for your Paul. Maybe you want to be a Barnabas. There's intentionality in everything. So, if we could, if worship, if you guys would come back up. God's doing some good stuff.